from Microbe TV. This is Infectious Disease Puscast episode 33, recorded on July 19, 2023. I'm Daniel Griffin, and not joining me today is Sarah Dong. Sarah Dong is taking a little bit of a break, so we will uh, let everyone know when she is back. But welcome to another Puscast. References, as always, are available in our show notes at Microbe TV, the home of our growing multimedia empire. Now, PUSCAST is a review of the infectious disease literature for the last two weeks that we found interesting or entertaining. And now, on to the literature, shall we? Well, we'll start with viral. And, and as a reminder, remember to listen to This Week in Virology, our uh, weekly clinical updates, as well as our deep dives. But let me start with the article, Early Antiretroviral Therapy not associated with higher cryptococcal meningitis mortality in people with human immunodeficiency virus in high-income countries, an international collaborative cohort study published in CID. Now, I have to say, this is a very important and a potentially paradigm-challenging publication. So, so here is where we are before we look at this study. Randomized controlled trials, RCTs, from low- and middle-income settings suggested that early initiation of antiviral therapy Therapy, ART, leads to higher mortality rates among people uh, with HIV who present with cryptococcal meningitis. Now, there's limited information about the impact of ART timing on mortality rates in similar people in high income settings. Um, so we quote these studies, they impact our treatment paradigm, and we have all kinds of ideas on why this is something we can just translate right into high income settings. Um, but what is the data? Well, here are the data on IRT, ART naive, people living with HIV with cryptococcal meningitis diagnosed from 1994 to 2012 from Europe, North America, pooled from the COHERE NA Accord CNICS HIV cohort collaborations. Uh, Follow-up was considered to span from the date of CM diagnosis to the earliest of the following, death, last follow-up, or six months. Now, they used marginal structural models to mimic an RCT. So this is not an actual RCT. Comparing the effects of early, within 14 days of the diagnosis of cryptococcal meningitis, and late, 14 to 56 days after cryptococcal meningitis, ART on all-cause mortality, adjusting for potential confounders. So let's see. Is it going to be just like it is in low-income countries? Well, of 190 participants identified, 17% died within six months at um, cryptococcal meningitis diagnosis. Their median age was 38. The median CD4 T cell count was 19. Median HIV viral load, um, 5.3 log. Most participants were male. 76% started ART. So, as we talked about, mimicking an RCT with 190 people in each group, there were 13 deaths among participants with an early ART regimen and 20 deaths among those with a late ART regimen. So here they found little evidence that early ART was associated with higher mortality rates among people living with HIV, presenting with cryptococcal meningitis in high-income settings, contrary to all the data that we have gotten from uh, sub-Saharan Africa and other places. All right, sticking with HIV, the article implementing a rapid antiretroviral therapy program using starter packs for emergency department patients diagnosed with HIV infection was published in Open Form Infectious Disease. So here are the authors. Um, look at a protocol to provide rapid ART by using starter packs for eligible ED patients who end up testing HIV antigen antibody reactive. Um, eligible patients were not pregnant, were unlikely to have a false positive uh, test result, were discharged home, were ART naive, and acceptable liver and renal function, la lacking symptoms of a current opportunistic infection, um, so during the one-year study period, 
10,606 HIV tests were performed. 106 patients uh, with positive tests were assessed for this rapid eligibility. 29.2% um, were eligible for the ED rapid ART. 24.5% um, were offered it. 25 um, of the 26 that were offered it accepted were given starter packs um, for an overall ED rapid ART treatment rate of 23.6%. Um, two of the patients who received ED rapid ART were confirmed to be HIV negative, right? So we can move them out. Patients provided with the ED rapid ART were more likely to follow up by 30 days, 82.6% versus only 50% than patients not provided with the rapid ART. The six-month incidence of immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome was 4.3% among the 23 patients who are HIV positive and received the rapid ART. So pretty, pretty impressive. Those folks who come into the ED, they get diagnosed, they get put on treatment, over 80% are going to follow up. Folks get diagnosed in the ED and you do not jump in with treatment. Only about half of them are going to show back up for that 30-day appointment. All right. Bacterial, be sure to listen to This Week in Microbiology. Um, well, perhaps the most important article this week. So take a deep breath, get ready. I really like this one. Efficacy of a clinical decision rule to enable direct oral challenge in patients with low-risk penicillin allergy. So this is the PALACE randomized clinical trial published in JAMA Internal Medicine. Um, so for background, I don't think this will surprise any of our providers, but lots of people report a penicillin allergy, yet fewer than 5% of patients labeled with a penicillin allergy are truly allergic. Something like 10 to 20% of people are convinced that they are allergic, quote unquote, to penicillin. Now, what do we do? Well, the standard of care to remove the penicillin allergy label in adults is specialized testing involving prick and intradermal skin testing followed by an oral challenge of penicillin. Well, skin testing is resource intensive, limits the practice to specialist trained physicians, and restricts the global population who could undergo penicillin allergy delabeling. Um, those of you that have ever tried to get your patients to do this, the success rate is rather low. So, these are the results of a parallel, two-arm, non-inferiority, open-label, multi-center, international, randomized clinical trial that occurred in six specialized centers, three in North America, that's U.S. and Canada, um, and three in Australia from June 18, 2021 to December 2nd, 2022. Patients were randomly assigned to either direct oral challenge with penicillin, here you go, let's see how you do, or the standard of care arm of penicillin skin testing followed by oral challenge with penicillin. Um, the primary response was a physician-verified positive immune-mediated penicillin allergic response. A total of 382 adults were randomized with 377 ultimately included in the analysis, 187 in the intervention group, 190 in the control group. A penicillin reaction occurred in 0.5% in the intervention group and 0.5% in the control group. So one in 200 of these folks who were convinced that they were pen allergic. In the five days following the oral penicillin challenge, nine immune mediated adverse events were recorded in the intervention group, 10 in the control group, no serious adverse events occur. So um, I'm gonna sort of as a challenge, right? So many times patients come in, check box, I have a penicillin allergy. Let's spend a little bit of time, um, and maybe I'm going to suggest that people need to start thinking about taking the opportunity, doing that oral penicillin challenge if the patient reports something other than anaphylaxis, um, and potentially allowing that patient the opportunity to be treated with the most appropriate rather than the inferior second-line antibiotics. All right, the article, Infectious Diseases Consultation Associated with Reduced Mortality and Gram-Negative Bacteremia was recently published in CID. I would think this is another no-brainer. Why, why would you not want to call up the handy, helpful, friendly infectious disease doc when you have a patient with gram-negative bacteremia? Well, 
a patient has a serious infection with a significant risk of morbidity and mortality, is it going to be helpful? As they point out, gram-negative bacteremia can cause significant morbidity and mortality, but the benefit of ID consultation, apparently prior to the publication of this article, was not well-defined. A 24-site observational cohort study of unique hospitalized patients with 4,861 gram-negative bloodstream infection um, episodes demonstrated a 40% decrease of 30-day mortality in patients with ID consultation compared to those without. Dare I repeat that? A 40% decrease in mortality by just calling up the ID doc and getting some advice. So I will suggest that this is actually an underestimation of benefit as all these study sites had active antimicrobial stewardship programs with physician and pharmacy leadership, right? So this is on top of 40% reduction on mortality in addition to active antimicrobial stewardship programs. Maybe I should actually suggest that antimicrobial stewardship programs are not a substitute for a board-certified infectious disease specialist consultation. Um, so there are a couple issues here. So as we have discussed, 80% of counties in the US do not have a single ID physician. Can we cover this with telemedicine consultations? Is there something magical and required in our physical examination? Or is this a purely cognitive service that reduces the mortality by 40%? And in centers with a good supply of ID physicians, um, do we just make consultation mandatory? The baseline mortality was 14%. So one in seven was standard. Okay. The article, Positive Impact of 18F FDG PET slash CT on Mortality in Patients with Staphylococcus or a Spectremia Explained by Immortal Time Bias was recently published in CID. So there's this whole discussion around the potential benefit of getting a PET scan um, as far as potentially improving outcomes in staph aureus bacteremia, right? The idea is you're worried there's some sort of metastatic potential here. Maybe you're going to figure this out a little bit early with the magical PET scan. Um, so here we have the results of a prospective multi-center cohort study in two university and five non-university hospitals, including all patients with staph aureus bacteremia. So the, the PET CT was performed on clinical indication as part of usual care, press that they were getting all these done. Uh, primary outcome was 90-day all-cause mortality. Um, effect of the PET-CT was modeled with a Cox proportional hazards model um, using PET-CT as a time-varying variable and corrected for confounders for mortality. Um, secondary outcome was 90-day infection-related mortality uh, using the same analysis. In a subgroup analysis, they determined the effect of PET-CT in patients with high risk of metastatic infection. All right. And what did the data show? Of, a, of 476 patients, 37% underwent PET-CT. Um, day 90 all-cause mortality was 31%. And infection-related mortality was 17%. The confounder adjusted hazard ratio for all-cause mortality was 0.50 um, in patients that underwent PET-CT. So we're thinking pretty good so far. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Adjustment for immortal time bias changed the adjusted hazard ratio to 1.00. Likewise, after correction for immortal time bias, PET-CT had no effect on infection-related mortality, all-cause mortality in high-risk patients, or infection-related high-risk. Um, so let us dive a bit deeper into this topic. So Staph aureus bacteremia is often complicated by metastatic foci of infections such as endocarditis, vertebral osteomyelitis, deep tissue abscesses, which may not be clinically apparent during the initial evaluation. So presence of these metastatic foci warrants extended treatment with antimicrobial therapy and evaluation um, and potential source control interventions. So here's the problem with this immortal time bias. Once a person is enrolled in a trial, there's some interval during which the outcome event cannot occur. The research participants are, as we say, immortal in that they must survive long enough to receive the intervention being studied. So in this prospective cohort study, 
no association was found between performing the PET-CT imaging with improved all-cause 90-day survival in patients with staph aureus bacteremia. However, an analysis without adjustment for this immortal time bias would have falsely suggested that PET-CT was associated with lower day 90 mortality. All right. The article, Azithromycin for Bacterial Watery Diarrhea, a reanalysis of the antibiotics for children with severe diarrhea, the ABCD trial, incorporating molecular diagnostics, was published in JID. So antibiotics for children with severe diarrhea was a seven-country, placebo-controlled, double-blind efficacy trial of azithromycin in children 2 to 23 months of age with watery diarrhea accompanied by dehydration or malnutrition. In this study, they tested fecal samples for enteric pathogens utilizing quantitative PCR and employed pathogen-specific cutoffs based on genomic target quantity in previous case-controlled diarrhea etiology studies to identify likely and possible bacterial etiologies. Among 6,692 children, the leading likely etiologies were, and let's pay attention to these as we think about what we're going to find, rotavirus, 21%, um, ETEC, STETEC, 13%, Shigella, 12.6%, Cryptosporidium, 9.6%. Um, more than one quarter had a likely and 17.3% a possible bacterial etiology. Day three diarrhea was less common in those randomized to azithromycin versus placebo among children with a likely bacterial etiology, um, but not in other children. A similar association was observed for 90-day hospitalization or death. The magnitude of risk differences were similar among specific likely bacterial pathogens, including Shigella. So sort of an interesting article here and uh, maybe challenging a little bit um, about how we really try to limit antibiotics um, in watery as opposed to uh, bloody diarrhea. All right, a bit of a deeper dive on this article. This is something that comes up quite a bit. The article, Periprosthetic Joint Infection, Current Clinical Challenges, published in CID. You know, an article that's so good that I almost put it in twice. Now, overall, Periprosthetic joint infection impacts more than 2% of arthroplasty patients. So, one in 50, right? I wonder if patients are told that when they undergo the arthroplasty. You've got a one in 50 chance you're going to end up with an infection. So, first, the diagnosis. The clinical presentation of PJI, prosthetic joint infection, differs based on the timing of infection. Acute infections present within the first few weeks to months after the index procedure, usually with classic signs of infection, pain, redness, warmth, swelling at the surgical site. Some patients with acute PJI present with wound complications, persistent drainage, in contrast to chronic PJI caused by indolent organisms inoculating the surgical site, usually presenting within two years after the index procedure. The most common presenting symptom of chronic PJI is pain, which unfortunately overlaps with many non-infectious diagnoses, including polyethylene wear, aseptic loosening, and adverse local tissue reaction to metal, ALTR. The challenge in either situation is that crystalline disease or an acute flare of inflammatory arthritis may mimic infections. Now, as the authors point out, multiple guidelines have been developed for the diagnosis of PGI in hips and knees, including from the Musculoskeletal Infection Society, I hope you're all members, the International Consensus Meeting on Musculoskeletal Infection, and the European Bone and Joint Infection Society. In these guidelines, the presence of a sinus tract that communicates the joint or prosthesis and or the recovery of the same organism in at least, are you ready for this, two separate synovial fluid and or periprosthetic tissue cultures confirms PJI. However, the guidelines differ with respect to the thresholds of and weight afforded to a number of other factors such as sedimentation rate, C-reactive protein, synovial fluid white blood cell count, neutrophil percentage, synovial fluid alpha defense and anhistology, and how often do we really get those two separate synovial fluid cultures? A single positive culture for a pathogenic organism such as Staph aureus is highly likely to represent a true infection, 
while positive cultures for organisms such as cutie bacterium acnes and coag negative staph may be true positives or they might represent contamination. So not so easy. Um, in 2018, a scoring system was published as part of one of the guidelines with points relating to probable or possible um, joint infections. Six or greater with identified organism indicates probable, six or greater without, possible, fewer than six, unlikely. Um, and uh, I, will, I will suggest folks actually go and bring up this article. We'll leave a link into it, but they have a nice table one um, with the different criteria and, and how many points you get for each. Um, but moving on to management. The most commonly used surgical procedures include debridement, antibiotics, and implant retention or exchange procedures. And the authors point out that the DARE, that's the debridement antibiotic implant retention, are less successful with only about 60 to 67 percent success in several recent meta-analyses. So for patients with limited life expectancy, for those who might not survive surgery, treatment with antibiotics alone may be the only option. Um, without surgery, eradication of infection is not expected and long-term antibiotic suppression is usually recommended. But what about antibiotics? We do have IDS guidelines that are 10 years old, time to update those, suggesting four to six weeks of antibiotics, but no consensus on chronic suppressive antibiotics after this, and lots of practice variation around this all being IV versus a transition to oral. Um, based on the results of the duration of antibiotic treatment and prosthetic joint infection, that DATIPO trial in cases of DARE treatment um, Doses of antibiotics in some cases might need to be extended out to 12 weeks. All right. Now, this next one is, I'm going to say, fun and interesting. The article, Old World Medieval Treponema Pallidum Complex Treponematosis, a case report published in JID. So everyone remembers uh, that Columbus has been... Uh, blamed for syphilis, uh, bringing it back from the new world to the old world. Well, here, the authors describe in 7th to 8th century skeletal elements uncovered in Roquevert, France, an individual suspected of having an infectious disease investigated by paleo autoimmunohistochemistry and found to have T. pallidum predating by eight centuries previous detections of P. pallidum complex treponematoses in Europe, indicating that European populations were not naive to these pathogens before the 1493 introduction of a Central American T. pallidum complex pathogen overwhelmed the T. pallidum ones previously circulating in the old world. All right, the article in the fungal section, clinical impact of PCR reaction-based aspergillus and azole resistance detection in invasive aspergillosis, a prospective multi-center study published in CID. So these are the results of a prospective study where they evaluated the clinical value of the aspergenius PCR assay in hematology patients who got to name that, from 12 centers. The PCR assay detects the most frequent CYP51A mutations in A. fumigatus, conferring azole resistance. Patients were included when a CT scan showed a pulmonary infiltrate and BAL fluid sampling was performed. The primary endpoint was antifungal treatment failure in patients with azole-resistant invasive aspergillosis. Of 323 patients enrolled, complete mycological and radiological information was available for 94%, and probable invasive aspergillosis was diagnosed in 36%. Sufficient uh, BAL fluid for PCR testing was available in 91% of the cases. Aspergillus DNA was detected in 40%, and Aspergillus fumigatus DNA in 30%. The resistance PCR was conclusive in 65% and resistance detected in 14%. Two had a mixed azole susceptible resistant infection. In the six remaining patients, treatment failure was observed in one. Galactamanin positivity was associated with mortality, while an isolated positive aspergillus PCR was not. Seems like a no-brainer to want to know if there's azole resistance, and this study 
did show better outcomes than historical controls, but as they acknowledge, this was not a randomized trial. All right, still hanging out with Aspergillus, we have the article Superior Accuracy of Aspergillus Plasma Cell-Free DNA PCR over Serum Galactomannan for the Diagnosis of Invasive Aspergillosis, published in CID. So in this retrospective study, the overall sensitivity and specificity of Aspergillus Plasma Cell-Free DNA PCR was... Sensitivity, 86%. Specificity, 93.1. Let's compare that to galactomannan with a sensitivity of only 67.9, but a specificity of 89.8%. All right. A couple more articles to go. Parasitic. Uh, we'll be recording that, well, tomorrow. Not tomorrow when you're listening, but tomorrow from when I'm recording. Uh, be sure to listen to This Week in Parasitism. We have some uh, exciting cases and a great paper, but the article Tafenequin co-administered with dihydroartemisinin piperaquin for the radical cure of plasmodium vivax malaria in Spectre, a randomized placebo-controlled efficacy and safety study was published in the Lancet Infectious Diseases. So this, this for me was a little bit of a paradigm challenge, dare I say, but these are the results of a double blind, double dummy, parallel group study, um, G6PD dehydrogenase normal, um, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase normal, Indonesian soldiers with microscopically confirmed P. vivax malaria were randomly assigned by means of a computer-generated randomization schedule, one to one to one, to dihydroartemisinin piperaquin alone, dihydroartemisinin piperlin plus a masked single 300 milligram dose of tafenequin or dihydroartemisinin piperquin plus 14 days of primaquin. The primary endpoint was six month relapse free efficacy. They have a really nice figure two with some Kaplan Meyer survival curves for six month relapse free efficacy for the microbial intent to treat population. Um, but dare I say, between April 8th, 2018, February 4th, 2019, 164 patients screened for eligibility, 150 were randomly assigned, 50 per treatment group, six month Kaplan Meyer relapse free efficacy was 11% in the folks treated with dihydroartemisin piperlin alone versus 21% in those treated with tafenequin plus dihydroartemisin and piperquin, and 52% in folks that got primaquin plus dihydroartemisin piperquin. So they conclude that although tafenequin plus dihydroartemisin piperquin was statistically superior to dihydroartemisin piperquin alone for the radical cure of P. vivax malaria, the benefit was not clinically meaningful. This contrasts with previous studies in which tafenequin plus coroquin was clinically superior to coroquin. They also point out the results of the study do not support co-administration of a single 300 milligram dose of tafenequin. Um, I have to actually say, I mean, basically what happened here was the primaquin won out. And the MMWR notes from the field doubling of cyclo Spiridiasis cases partially attributed to a salicate Florida 2021-2022. So for background, cyclosporidiasis is a gastrointestinal infection caused by a protozoan parasite, cyclosporchiatinensis. The species is only known to infect humans and is acquired when oocysts are ingested through food or water contaminated with feces that contain the parasite. The illness was first reported in 1979 and the organism was identified and named in 1994. In Florida, reported numbers of cyclo uh, sporidiasis cases have been increasing over the last decade, 254 cases reported in Florida in 2021, and the number doubled to 513 in 2022. CDC uses a genotyping tool to aid epidemiological case linkage in near real time. 
among 211 successfully genotyped specimens from Florida, 73% were assigned to the same temporal genetic cluster, including 96% of 45 genotype specimens linked to the bagged salad cluster, and 39% of the 76 persons reporting Caesar salad kits with no further identifying information. So this is why we should only be eating deep fried foods and avoiding all vegetables. All right, moving on to miscellaneous, and I got a couple here, or really one long one, dare I say. Um, and I was sort of trying to figure out where do I put this one in. So the article, Efficacy and Safety of Adjunctive Corticosteroids in the Treatment of Severe Community Acquired Pneumonia, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Randomized Control Studies, was published in the BMC Journal Critical Care. Now, probably the right crowd, because ICU doctors love to do stuff, and given steroids is in the list of stuff, the authors let us know that they conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis using the Medline, Embase, clinicaltrials.gov, and Scopus databases for articles published until April 24, 2023 only randomized controlled trials that assess the clinical efficacy and safety of adjunctive corticosteroids for treating um, were included. The primary outcome was the 30-day all-cause mortality. All right. So they go on to say that a total of several RCTs involving 1,689 patients were included in this study. Um, they actually say severe RCTs, so maybe a little bit of a typo there. Um, we read that in these um, seven studies, when all lumped together, there was a lower mortality rate at day 30 than the control group. Uh, relative risk of 0 0.61 compared to the control group, the study group, folks getting steroids, had a lower risk of requirement of mechanical ventilation, um, relative risk 0 0.57 with a p-value of 0 0.001, shorter length of ICU stay, shorter hospital stay, no significant difference was observed between the study and the control groups in terms of GI bleeding, healthcare associated other infections, acute kidney injury. And they have actually a, a, a sort of a, a nice um, figure too. It all sounds good, all sounds great, until one starts looking closely at the individual cow pies. As one sees when they start to look at figure two, three of the four studies had concerns regarding their validity and risk of bias, issues with randomization, issues with bias in the results. Um, going on to figure three, there's a nice forest plot where you start to look at each of the individual studies. Um, what I will say is if you look at each of the studies individually, uh, there unfortunately um, is not a lot of uh, statistically significant uh, findings here. Actually, DeQuinn in 2023 is the only one that seems to favor steroids without crossing the line. Um, we have Maduri in 2022. We have Torres in 2015, Sabri in 2011, El Gamrari in 2006, Khan Fal Nirati in 2005, and Merrick in 1993, where we have just incredibly wide error bars. So to put this in context, as interesting as this article seems, I will link to the current IDSA, American Thoracic Society guidelines, that in the case of corticosteroids, recommend not to use. Only consider in patients with refractory septic shock. So a little bit of a word of caution. I, I think uh, Mark Chrislip would, uh, would agree. Be careful when you pile a whole bunch of cow pies together when each individual cow pie is invalid, has a risk of bias, issues with randomization, issues with the results. Um, you can't stack them all up and then trust the results. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of this podcast. And as always, the references for this show are available at microbe.tv, the home of our multimedia empire. You can find the infectious disease podcast at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv forward slash podcast. We love to get your questions, comments, and paper suggestions. Send them to podcast at microbe.tv. And with Sarah taking a little time off, uh, that would be helpful. Send a few more my way so I don't have to get them all. If you like 
what we do. Consider supporting the science shows at Microbe TV. Go to microbe.tv forward slash contribute or go to parasiteswithoutborders.com and click on the donate button. Um, Sarah Dong is not here, but she can be found, we think, on Twitter at Swindong, um, at Febrile Podcast or at febrilepodcast.com. I'm Daniel Griffin, and you can find me at parasiteswithoutborders.com, on Twitter at Daniel Griffin MD, as well as on the other podcasts, This Week in Parasitism and This Week in Virology Clinical Updates. And as always, thank you for this most interesting consultation and allowing us to participate in the care of this most difficult and challenging case. We shall continue to follow along with you. Thank you and dictation and goodbye. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Another podcast is infectious. Infectious.